please. Thank you. Uh, I'm Urminder, and I'm a second year PhD student at Iowa State University. And today I'm going to be talking about my work. I'm going to be talking about my work in orphan genes. Uh, so what are orphan genes? So let's consider this hypothetical example. So these are some proteins in a species, hypothetically, let's say that. And using any homology search program like BLAST, you can find homologs to these proteins. Uh, Yeah, so using BLAST, you can uh, find homologs to these proteins, and then you can see where these homologs are in the ancestors. For example, uh, you may be able to trace back these to, you know, all the way back to cellular organisms. For some proteins, you may only be able to trace back to some phylogenetic level, and for some proteins, you may not find any homologs. So these genes which codes for these proteins are known as orphan genes. So these genes codes proteins which have no homologs, and many of these genes have been identified, and some of them have been found to be functional. For example, CLLU1 and PBOV1 genes in humans are associated with cancer. QQS gene, which was identified in our lab in Arabidopsis thaliana, can increase the protein content in the plant. So how do these genes ar arise? So I'll give you a hypothetical example. Consider a non-genic ancestral sequence. So this has no open reading frame, so cannot code for a protein. So this sequence is passed along to the descendants. And if a specific mutation occurs here, for example, a deletion, this can create an open reading frame in this non-coding region, which can uh, give an opportunity to code for a novel protein. So this is one example how orphan genes can arise de novo from non-coding or non-genic sequences. So these genes are important and they have, uh, they can enable the organism to compete or to adapt in changing environment. For example, the gene AFGPS in certain codfish, it codes for an anti-freeze protein which allows the fish to survive the freezing temperature. QQS gene in, in Italiana confers broad spectrum resistance to pathogens and CLLU1, PBOV1 genes are associated with cancers, uh, so they can be important biological markers to study. And they may also be interesting candidates for genetic modification. Now, my work focuses on finding orphan genes in humans, so what I'm doing is I'm taking data from ensemble. So first, I took all the known protein sequences in ensemble, and then I'm basically using BLAST to find those proteins which do not have any homologs against the NR database. Then, as we know, the human uh, genome is still not very well annotated. The annotation is incomplete right now, and referring to the talk by Dr. Salzberg on first day. So I extracted open reading <coughs> frames from the human genome, and then I used PLASTX to find those which may potentially code for a protein that may have a homolog in the NR database, and I removed those. And I was left with around over one million uh, human ORFs and then I selected 10,000 randomly to proceed with my study. So these were my potential candidate orphan genes in humans. So first thing is I wanted to look at how the numbers vary as we go far from the humans in terms of evolutionary distance. So we can see this bar chart shows the number of proteins in humans which have no homologs in these species. For example, in chim chimpanzee, around 28 uh, around 2,820 proteins in humans have no homologs in chimpanzee and so on. And we expect as we go far from humans, we expect this number to increase. But we see that in macaque, this goes down. And in fact, it's the lowest. So there can be two things we can say about this. One thing is that macaque genome is annotated with a lot of pro protein uh, genes which should not be there. Or the other thing is that macaque genome is actually very well annotated as compared with others, and it, is, it has more complete annotation. So again, uh, Dr. Salzberg on first day, I remember he said that this is the case, that macaque was re-annotated and it's very well. So maybe that is the case. Uh, but I'm interested in all the human uh, uh, proteins which have no homologs in all these. 
Okay, so next thing is to find the expression of uh, these uh, transcripts. So first I downloaded RNA-seq data from SRA. Then I also downloaded the metadata from SRA and GEO because that will be helpful when I'm analyzing this data. So I downloaded around 12 TB terabytes of data, which is huge, and around 8,600 runs. Then I'm mapping this, these runs to all the known human transcripts using Salmon and my unannotated ORFs, which I selected like 10,000 randomly. Then I normalize my data and counts, uh, and then I'm analyzing the data with the metadata using MetaOmgra, which is a Java software which I'm developing in my lab. Then, uh, so I'll share some results. So the distribution, uh, this graph shows the distribution of the mean expression levels of the three types of transcripts across the runs. So we can see the coding transcripts, the mean expression level is high in most of the runs. But in some of the runs, the mean expression level of the ORFs is comparable to the coding ones. Later I found the ORFs and ORFNs are specifically expressed in only some of the runs. For example, this ORF on chromosome 11 is highly expressed in blood samples, so RNA-seq from blood samples. So this snapshot you see is from my software meta on graph, and you can easily sort in the expression levels using some metadata condition. And then this may indicate that there is some function of this ORF in, in that sample. Then I found that this expression of this ORF is also highly correlated with these two known genes, SPI1 and ARRB2. So this may be helpful when further studying the function of this. So another example is this gene, krt ap one 19 which is on chromosome 21. So it's a monoexonic gene. So this is already in ensemble, annotated. So I found that this is highly expressed in melanoma and almost not expressed in other samples. So this may have a function with, with this condition. Then I just uh, quickly took the uh, genomic sequence and I used BLAST then to find uh, the uh, region of similarity on uh, chimpanzee, chromosome 21. And I found uh, that in chimpanzee there's a stop codon which is in frame which basically makes a smaller open reading frame, but in human, it has been mutated. So this was a very quick uh, uh, analysis I did, so I need uh, further, I need to further go back and look to give a more detailed explanation. So in conclusion, in my work I have seen that there are open reading frames, ORFs, which are expressed highly in selective runs. So we need to identify these, and many of these can be real genes. A subset of these can be orphan genes. And identification of such genes can improve our existing annotation of human genome. And predicting function of orphan genes and these ORFs can uh, reveal interesting uh, species-specific uh, traits and phenotypes, including disease resistance and disease susceptibility. And in future, I intend to do these things. So I uh, intend to predict uh, the function of selected orphan genes which I identify from my pipeline using uh, approaches like clustering on gene networks and find evidence of translation using riboseq or uh, proteomics data and finally examine why these genes are selected by evolution. <coughs> and these are some of the people in my lab. I'm, I'm thankful for, to all these people, Dr. Dorman and Dr. Huang at Iowa State University. This work was funded by NSF. And my poster is there, B859. Please stop by, and if you'd like to have more discussion. Of course, I missed a lot of points in my pipeline. So, so we need to stop here. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, we're gonna switch speaker. We're also gonna switch chair. So uh, we can have time for quick question while we switch. Yes, please. So my question is this. Um, there are a couple things that could be happening here, and one is segmental uh, deletion. Mm -hmm. So I wondered if you've tested at all the, the organization of the orphan genes and whether they are co-located so that that might explain some aspect of that. And the second thing is, in terms of function, uh, we often use orthologs to predict function, but another methodology is to use domain structures. And have you been able, are these things, uh, have predicted um, functions based on their domain structures? 
Sounds okay, so for the for the for the first one, it may be possible the deletions and maybe other events. Maybe it, it's a duplication and really rapid divergence. You, well, I'm, so we I'm wondering about segmental duplication. Uh, we can have a discussion. Yeah. There. Okay. Oh, okay. Sure. So, sure. And the other one, did you, you look at domain that structures? Not, not yet. So maybe it, it may not be possible because it may not be conserved the structures. But but what? The, Oh, we, can we can, okay, because they should have domain structures and that should be already functionally curated, so. so good afternoon, uh, my name is Lon 